So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to wish you all a warm welcome to this morning's BSEC webinar this late October when the sun is actually shining, which is lovely, I think. Um, we see that there are still people signing in, but I suggest we get started so we have the time we need uh, for this webinar. So I'm delighted to see you all in this digital room supporting our mission of promoting bilateral trade by sharing your knowledge, promoting your companies and actually also doing our very best to introduce and refer our members to each other and to other relevant <coughs> um, potential clients or customers. And for all of you this morning, I would like this uh, webinar to be as interactive as possible. So we do rely on you all to ask your questions, um, big or small. We have an expert with us today. Um, so listen to our members. We understand that this um, during this fast changing world, we are all looking for answers. And we as a chamber, we aim with these webinars to give our members and also cooperation partners um, some kind of solid foundation and a platform to discuss some of the presumptions for the future development of the world. And we have done so during both the spring and the autumn so far in cooperation with our members, with the British Embassy in Sweden and other chambers of commerce, both in Sweden, but also globally to further uh, broaden our members platforms of potential networking and information sharing. So challenges that we're all facing right now are, of course, the pandemic, the digital transformation, the fourth industrial revolution, if you like, the outcome of the US election and the EU exit, not the least. And um, I would just before we get on to today's uh, subject, I would like to quickly run through our housekeeping rules before I hand over to our guest of honor and speaker from patron company Nodia. So this presentation will be recorded and please do keep yourself on mute until given the word. If you like, you can keep your cameras on. That's also very nice. Do ask your questions during the presentation by using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you have any tech issues, do send an email to Emil Schellqvist. So the event today is part of a series of events that we started during the spring with the aim of keeping our members um, up to date on the big challenges in the economy in Sweden, in the UK, in the EU and also globally. And um, what is affecting the changes and what can we expect going forward? forward in this very, very fast changing and not the least challenging world, uh, world for, for many of us. To help us shed lights on where we are right now and what to expect for the foreseeable future, we're very, very pleased to have with us the chief economist from Nordea Bank, Annika Winst. And Annika, you have been with us before and uh, Annika has a vast experience within the areas of um, and uh, in this area, I would say, uh, starting her career at the Ministry of Finance. And for the last 12 years, Annika has been Nordea's chief economist. So what will be the future development of the economy? This will, of course, affect all of us. Um, will we see a speedy recovery or not? How, when and will we see some kind of econ economy bounce back? Um, today, I'm extremely happy and delighted to welcome Annika Winst um, to shed the lights on these broad areas. Annika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody. You said you were looking for answers. I'm not sure I managed to give you that, but uh, some reflection and thoughts from my perspective, at least. And uh, please feel free to, to ask questions and uh, hopefully I can answer some of them at least. Uh, but I will start to say it was a dramatic downturn we saw uh, during the spring, uh, faster and deeper than ever. 
And that's, of course, because nearly the whole world closed down at the same time. We have never seen that before. Uh, and that was really dark, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the numbers and so. But it's also very important to remember that already in April, May, June, depending on which country you're looking at or which sector, we're starting the recovery. Uh, and actually, and therefore the heading bouncing back, actually uh, it is much better than uh, we feared in the beginning of uh, the crisis. And I think it's very important to remember that. Uh, but uh, if you turn to the next slide, I think it's also wise to be humble. Uh, it's a virus. We don't control it yet. And as you know, uh, it's uh, spreading more faster now. Uh, and we are all, uh, countries have also implemented more restrictions. And if you look at those numbers, you can see if you look at the line, blue line, the cases, that's increasing very, very fast, as you know. And the left hand graph, if you include the UK, the UK. And the line is, of course, uh, high above the level we had in, in during the spring. But as an economist, I'm more interested in those numbers, uh, which the bars, uh, fatalities, and also care cases, hospitals, places, uh, because that means if that increase, we will see more restrictions. And, and France, uh, Germany, but also our countries have now implemented more, more restriction. I think it's, it's wise to expect that we will see more of them. But as you can see, the bars is still much lower than during uh, the spring and uh, there are sp space capacity uh, in lots of area but there is of course a risk that the politicians will be afraid and scared and they implement those restrictions which of course will have negative impact even this time on on the economy but i think it's important to remember that uh, during the spring the whole world closed down at the same time i don't think that we will see that uh, this time, because China is in front of us this time. They have been through the second wave and the growth in China is uh, uh, better than we uh, believed during the spring and the consensus for China is, for example, 2% growth this, this year. So they are delivering and that's very important for open economies like the Swedish one, uh, Germany and Europe and, and for the UK as well. Uh, so I think we will uh, have more restriction, but but we will not shut down and close down the whole world at the same time uh, again. And that's very important because that means uh, if we turn off the lights during the spring, we still have the dimmer on, uh, not as uh, lighting as uh, during, uh, before the uh, crisis, but it's still on. And then you can turn it up and you can, of course, turn it down if it's necessary, but it's on. So it's important to remember that. And then if you turn to the next uh, slide, Thanks. Uh, so there have also been a lot of discussion about strategies and which country have done the most right or wrong. And I don't like uh, discussion. I, firstly, I think it's too early. We are not out of it yet, so we don't know who have handled it in the best way. But it's also important to remember this is a global pandemic. So if we are clean or healthy here in Sweden or in the UK, uh, we still have problems with other countries, not ours. So uh, it's too early and we are dependent on each other. But I think the most important, it's not about the strategy, it's much more about the business structure. And if you look at those uh, two graphs, you have the Nordic countries here, and this is car data. Um, some of you, I guess, have the, those uh, in, your wall, uh, in your mobile phone now, but some of you still have them in the wallet. But th that's bank card data and what we are uh, consuming. And uh, the most uh, important conclusion from those two, you can see we have goods left hand and service right hand. That the pattern is very likely in, in uh, all the four countries. So there are no big differences. And then I, you remember that Norway and Denmark closed down nearly two totally, Finland somewhere between, and Sweden rather open. Uh, so the conclusion, it doesn't matter which strategy we have, it, it's more a sectoral uh, differences between uh, those areas. And there you can see that goods is above uh, the pre-crisis level, but services, uh, depending on restrictions, of course, is still below in all countries.
In the right hand graph, you can see that the green line is Sweden. And the drop was bigger in Norway and Denmark, uh, the blue, in the beginning when they closed down totally. But as you can see in, in the summer when they were allowed to go to the hairdresser and uh, beauty shops and so on, they had a catch up effect. So if you take the mean during the year, there are no differences between the countries. And that's also important to remember. So uh, it's too early. We are dependent on each other and the business structure is much more more important. And then Finland, Sweden, Germany and the UK, we are rather close together because we are dependent on the world that they open up the economy around uh, globally. And for Denmark example, they are lucky because they, the most important export sectors there is uh, health uh, and uh, food. And that's uh, both those two uh, are, we have bought a lot during the pandemic, of course. So uh, if you turn to the next slide, if you look at the growth numbers, we can see as it's not as bad as it really had feared. And I think also, as I mentioned before, it's important to look at China. And as you can see, China is back. And most forecasts, we have 1.5, as you can see in the table for China this year. But consensus is actually 2% now. Uh, and as you can see, they are also back in the red uh, line in the graph. And our forecast for the US, Euro area and Sweden is, is not that we will be back uh, so far. Uh, as you can see, we are uh, up on the 100 uh, around the middle of 2022, somewhere there. And a little bit earlier for Sweden, uh, we believe in next year there. Uh, but I will also say that there are risks on the upside here because China has handled it and they are uh, driving the economy. And uh, um, uh, that's much better than during uh, the spring. And there is also a chance that we have some vaccine uh, in the, the first half of next year, maybe. Uh, and then that will also have a positive impact. So we are talking a lot about the negative things. And again, be humble, be flexible. We need to take care of the virus. But uh, where we are now, if you look at the economic numbers, uh, actually, it's much better than most people believed uh, during the spring. And it's important to remember and there are upside risks as well. And then if you turn to next one, <clears throat> what happened then on the financial markets and left hand side in the equity market and right hand side in the bond market. And uh, as a macroeconomic year, yeah, I think it's uh, really strange that uh, the equity market is back. If you look at the uh, growth numbers, uh, plummeting, uh, high unemployment, uh, falling employment, uh, but the uh, uh, equity market is at the sa same level as, as before. But the reason behind that is, of course, what we can see in the right hand graph. Central bankers around the world have promised to keep rates low, uh, both uh, longer bond, government bonds, if you look at the graph, but also, as you can see in the table, uh, policy rates will be low for a very long period. And this is, of course, very important. And if you can't have a return uh, on the bond market, uh, then you need to take risk. And uh, the biggest capital out there is, of course, um, pension funds and we have been promised return so they need to take risk and that's why we can see uh, this uh, upturn uh, on the equity market even if it's a bit shaky at the moment when people are a little bit more worried about what's going on on uh, the virus uh, front uh, I often got the question if we need to revise down our forecast now when we can see that the virus start to spread again. But most uh, forecasts, I guess, have, have that in their mind because they told us already during the spring that we could expect that it should start again during uh, the autumn when the weather is cold and we will have to go inside again. So I think most most forecasts have have it in their forecast, but of course there's a risk if it starts to increase faster than uh, people expect. Yeah, then we will see more restrictions than than uh, are putting in the far, in the forecast at the moment. Uh, yes, and then if you turn to the next slide. It's not just the pandemic. We also have an election coming up, which is very important and. Uh, I think there are four areas, the one you can see in left hand, which are important for us. And uh, if you're thinking from a financial market perspective, there are two things that are very interesting. One, they want to have a clear result as soon as possible. Two, they want to have a fiscal package in place as soon as possible.
And if we start with the first one, uh, the poli uh, politics, uh, then there, there is a chance or risk, depending on who you are, that Biden will be president, but he also will manage to take both the House and the Senate. And then, of course, it's very easy for him uh, to implement a package rather immediately after he uh, turned into the White House uh, as a president, uh, the 20th of January. And if uh, he managed to take both houses uh, here, then, of course, the financial market will uh, relax already uh, as soon as we know that. But there is also a risk, and now I say risk because this problematic, even if you, if you like uh, Trump, is that we have... Um, uh, election and we don't know it's very very close and, and it's not just Trump talking about that it's uh, fake uh, if nearly 50 percent of the population also believe it's fake then we have problem and then there are risks that it will pop up complication it will take times and uncertainty is not good for the financial market and risk appetite and therefore that's a bit scary uh, at the moment, I think most people say that around 70% for, for Biden and, and then um, 20 for uh, an easy uh, Trump and then for a, a chaotic uh, election results around 5-10% somewhere. But I think it's too early to count out uh, Trump at the moment. He is really good to put the light on the right things and... Uh, for him and I, I would say uh, I will at least give him 40 percent even if it's very very um, close today uh, in, in um, when we look at uh, how people are saying they will really vote but then if you uh, leave the politics and I think the global uh, trade and cooperation those areas are most important for economists like uh, uh, Europe Sweden and, and the UK because we are so dependent on trade and there are big differences between uh, the candidates uh, where Trump as you know America first America companies uh, gas uh, oil um, fossil fuel and so on uh, and that means that I think there is a risk that he will uh, turn against Europe as well as we have seen uh, uh, thanks uh, against China for example and uh, the risk is of course the car industry that's important for the US for Germany but also for Sweden and then uh, if you look at Biden uh, he is uh, Democrats are not uh, pro uh, trade and he of course he had to take care of American interests but he will do it in another way and he will at least have a um, talk and cooperation and try to, to do it in a wise way. And we heard that uh, last uh, last day from, from Biden already. And he will also continue to keep up those cooperation we already have. And that's at least important for Sweden. I don't know what you th think in, in the UK when you are leaving now, but uh, if you take WTO, uh, the Paris Agreement and so on, those are much more important for, for Biden than for, uh, for Trump. And that's very important important for uh, a small open economy as the Swedish and, and uh, for our companies. If you look at the economy and the uh, fiscal uh, package, uh, then I would say that Trump will uh, spend more money near term, uh, more money out. He wants to have the equity market happy and he will cut uh, taxes. Uh, on the other hand, Biden, he will also spend a lot of money. Uh, he financed 50%, close to 50% of what he will spending, and uh, but he will uh, hike rate uh, uh, taxes in the beginning and then he will invest them in, in infrastructure and social uh, and so so uh, there are big differences uh, between uh, if you look at, uh, at those uh, package and fed they will of course do whatever they can during uh, this time and then if you turn to the next one and then I, I, uh, I've already said a couple of words about China but it's very important as you can see here uh, the steep of the curve is much steeper than if you look at the right hand graph with Europe but that's so important for Europe as well and for, for um, uh, especially for Germany and the engine for Europe and you can see that both manufacturing and service is above the level we had before and then if you look at the right hand graph you can see that manufacturing is but service uh, depending on all those restrictions of course is, uh, is uh, still below and as as I said, a uh, consensus forecast for China is 2% this year. That's important to, to remember. And then 
Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at different uh, uh, different countries in uh, Europe, uh, you can see that the UK dropped a lot, uh, actually much more than France, uh, Italy and uh, Germany <coughs> during the spring. But you can see that the pattern is rather close when we are coming back, bouncing back. Uh, but it will take a long time until 22 uh, before we have the same level as before. And this is, of course, a really, really high cost uh, to handle at the same time that we had to handle the pandemic. And then if you look at Britain, uh, I guess it's the next slide. Thank you. What will then uh, the Bank of England do? Yes, uh, if you look at the left hand graph, that's CPI and of course uh, CPI, and that's below the target. And that means that uh, people now start to expect Bank of England to, uh, to cut rates more. And if you look at the uh, right hand graph, you can see the red line there. Actually, the markets uh, forecast and they believe that the uh, rate will be. be um, below zero uh, in the future. So the central bank will be there in the UK, but in a lot of other countries as well. And the inflation is very, very low at the moment. There are a lot of central bankers talking about they don't care about the inflation at the moment because we have been below for so long time. So we can be a bit above uh, for a while without hiking rates. So I think that you can expect that we will have very, very loose monetary policy for a long time. And then if you turn to next uh, slide, please. Uh, you, uh, we can look at the Brexit uh, perspective and then you can see the uncertainty index as I guess you have seen before and uh, that started of course after the, um, the have, you have voted and then uh, it has been a bit bumpy the lately but now it's back on high level again uh, as you can see and people are worried about uh, the uncertainty from, from the Brexit. And if you look at the right hand graph, I think it's rather interesting that if you look at the trading service, the light blue one, that was uh, dropped and then bouncing back half of the drop nearly. But if you look at the um, dark blue one, which is uh, the financial service export, that's back on, on record high level. And that's rather impressive when we have talked about that uh, lots of changes in the financial market, uh, depending on Brexit and banks moving out and so on. But the export is on, on a really high level, even if um, uh, the trading service is uh, a bit below that. So that's important to, to remember as well. And then if you turn to uh, Sweden and look at uh, our economy, you can see this is Swedish export markets. And uh, here are a couple of interesting things. Uh, number one and two is Norway and, then, and Germany, and, and it has been so since the middle of 20s somewhere. And uh, also interesting is to look at the dark blue line, which is uh, the US. And as you can see, uh, in the beginning of 2000, we had uh, an export to, to the US around uh, plus 10. And then they dropped and it were, there were around five, six in the top ranking of Swedish export markets. But now it's coming back again. And uh, that's why we're talking so much about the election in, in Sweden now, because they are our third biggest export market. So uh, the US is really important for Swedish companies. And then uh, also interesting to see is uh, the UK, the, uh, the red one. And as you can see, uh, you have uh, been much more important uh, uh, historically, uh, and uh, we have also seen uh, an even bigger drop uh, lately. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, problematic. Uh, we are so close to each other in many ways, and we really need uh, the UK in, uh, in agreement with the EU and so on. So it's, it's, it's really a shame that <laughs> the, uh, you are not in the top anymore. But that's, uh, that's the truth, and uh, that's the way we need to ha hand it. And then also, if you look at China, the pink uh, in the bottom, you can see that China actually have increased uh, the export market for, for UK at the moment, so mo more important. And then if you turn to the next slide, please. Uh, so if you look at the numbers in Sweden, as I said before, we are so dependent on, on uh, the global world and that countries open up. And this is the world trade and Swedish export. And you can see it's nearly copy paste. And I've taken a long series because I want you to know that this is uh, uh, always so. It doesn't mean, it, it means that it doesn't uh, care if, if the krona is weak or, or, or strong because we have been weak and strong krona during this period, but it's still copy paste. So, uh, 
it's very, very important for us. But as you can read in the right hand, World Trade has taken back two thirds of uh, the loss during the spring, and that's really impressive. I think most people uh, had been uh, hadn't believed that if I had told them in March, for example, uh, but uh, we are there now. And as you can see below, the Swedish export actually is back to pre-crisis level already in August. And uh, people are not talking very much about that. We are talking about the problem, unemployment, youth unemployment, foreign-born unemployment. Uh, uh, we're also talking a lot about um, the service sector, hotel, restaurants, uh, culture and so on. And those companies, they have really, really problem and they need help. Of, of course, but uh, those are uh, below 5% of production in Sweden and below 5% of uh, employment in Sweden. So we are talking so much about those areas who really have big problem, but we are not talking uh, nearly uh, um, uh, about uh, those companies who is doing well. And that's very important to remember. The export sector is 45%, uh, around 45% of GDP in Sweden. And then if you turn to next one, please, you can see the left hand side, uh, there you can see that the GDP also is uh, back in August, two thirds of the drop. And uh, if you look at the uh, right hand side, you can see the industrial production compared uh, with Germany. And uh, industrial production in Sweden is also back on pre-crisis level in August, not in Germany. And that's, of course, important that that will continue. And if you look at the left hand graph, you can see there is a um, circle around August and it's a little bit less steep curve there and this will be very interesting to look at uh, in the future because when you uh, compare uh, with those really low levels we had uh, during uh, Q2, then of course it's easy to have strong growth numbers but uh, the level is still low so it's very, uh, um, you have to um, look at both gross numbers and the level. Uh, and uh, uh, that means that we now are, are looking at uh, a, a recovery which level out a bit. Uh, we can't expect that the growth number will be as fast as they were on Q3. Uh, but, but I believe that we will see rather strong Q3 in the whole world. Uh, I'm more worried about what's coming up now in Q4 and Q1 and Q2, but Q3 will be really good because we are comparing with so uh, low levels. Yes, and then if you look at the labor market, uh, we have the same uh, problem here. We are talking about bad uh, signals and stories, but we are not talking about what's going uh, in the right direction. And actually, we have uh, we have been the, uh, less pessimistic than other forecasts compared to the central uh, bank, uh, minister of finance, and so on. And actually, if you look at the left-hand graph, which, which is employment, you can see that uh, the real numbers are even better than our forecast and we are the less pessimistic. So it's actually better than we expect. Uh, and that means that it's important to remember more people are receiving a job today. And if you look at the right hand graph, new vacancy, actually we have received one more week. So the red um, a line is nowadays above the grey one, which means that in, during week 43, which was uh, last week, uh, then we had uh, more new vacancies in 2020 compared to 2019, which is rather impressive. And I guess you haven't heard about it. And that's very, very uh, uh, interesting for companies to know that we are turning around. We are in the uh, we have passed the worst and we are turning on the in the right direction. And then if you look at the unemployment, turn to the next one, please. Then you can see uh, compare the uh, corona crisis compared with the financial crisis. And most people are, are still saying that the corona crisis is worse than the financial crisis, but that's not true. Already in the beginning of the summer, the unemployment started to level out. Uh, if you look at the corona crisis, uh, the dark blue line. Uh, and uh, we have also received uh, one more number here. So the unemployment top, uh, the top was in June 9.2 and now it's 8.8. .8. But we are not talking about that either. And if you look at the star, the red star here, you can see that's uh, the forecast for near. The central bank and the minister of finance are very close to that. But if we will end up there, then, as you can see, the steepness of the curve must be at least as steep during, as during the spring. And during the spring, uh, 
the industry and the service sector, the restaurants and hotels, uh, there was a lot of people uh, um, uh, had had to left uh, their jobs. But we don't have those. They can't do it again. And the industry is, is taking back all those people. So it's very tricky to understand how we can manage to come up to this high level uh, in the end of, of the year. So I think uh, most focus actually are a bit too pessimistic about the labor market in Sweden at the moment. Then, of course, there are risk if we, they will implement more restrictions and so on. But then I guess we will see that next year instead of uh, this autumn. And then if you look at the right hand graph, uh, that's counties and every county in Sweden actually had uh, falling unemployment in September compared to August. But when media reported from that, they said that every county in Sweden have increased unemployment in September. But the problem is that they compare with September 2019. And of course, unemployment is higher than before the pandemic. Uh, but that's not so interesting for companies. Companies want to know, are we going in wrong direction, leveling out or in the right direction? And uh, we are going in the right direction at the moment. So uh, some lights uh, in the dark uh, virus um, um, area we are in environment we are in now uh, from from growth numbers and also from uh, the Swedish uh, labor market. And then if you turn to the next one, uh, if you look at what will then the central bank do with this environment and uh, if, if you had this drop in GDP, uh, drop in employment, then of course it's uh, normal to cut the rates, but they don't want to do it and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that household sector don't need it, uh, the house prices are record high, so uh, the rate is not a problem, companies don't need it and there is a risk that uh, that could be problematic for the banks and then we will have a financial crisis with negative interest rates. Uh, and then if you look at the gray area, you can also see, and this is maybe the most important, that uh, even the Riksbank don't believe that they will reach the target 2% during this period, which means that if they cut rates to negative, they will not come back uh, in the coming years. Uh, they need to be, they need to keep the rates at, at negative and they don't, don't want to do that. And that also means, if you take the next one, please, uh, that uh, we now see a bit stronger uh, Krona, but I would say that it is very much about the dollar. And during the pandemic, a lot of people bought funds, bought dollar because it's safe heaven. And when things start to turn around, they start to sell dollar and therefore we could see a stronger Krona and pound and so on. Uh, and then if you compare with the euro area instead, uh, you can uh, think that uh, before the central bank in Sweden was um, talking about looser monetary policy than ECB and that means that we end up with a very weak krona. Now they are uh, satisfied with this level which means that they have the same policy that others and that means that yeah, as we have stronger growth possibilities uh, uh, that indicate a stronger krona as well. Uh, and for UK, uh, I would say that I'm rather impressed that they uh, that uh, the pound has managed to keep as strong as it has actually uh, under this pressure. Uh, so, uh, but you can see in, in our table uh, the forecast, and the, there is the pound against the Swedish krona. I don't know which is the best for you to look at. But when we are doing forecast for ex exchange rate, uh, we always do euro dollar and then you will seek and then you had uh, euro dollar uh, you, um, dollar seek yes please the finally then to sum up uh, please it's wise to be humble be flexible uh, the virus is still there and uh, i i think we could expect more res restriction but it's also very important to uh, to remember that uh, recovery is better than expected and we will have very loose monetary and fiscal policy in the whole world for a very long time and for the swedish economy we are more people to job than to unemployment at the moment at least so I will stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Annika, for a very insightful presentation. Um, I know that there are a few questions that we would like to come on to. If there is anyone who would like to ask a question, do raise your hand or write in the chat function. Um, I, I see that we have quite a few bankers um, on the um, well, 
attending today. So uh, would maybe Björn Savén or Anna Fall or Bo Lind like to say something? Erik Schimblom, uh, please just raise your hand. Or even Ian Richardson, I know, has always lots of questions. Uh, I will hand over to um, to Emil to moderate the questions from the floor that has been sent already. So Emil. Thank you, Christina, and thank you so much, Annika, for that presentation. Uh, Rikard, I can tell that you have raised your hand. Um, if you would like, please unmute yourself and ask your question to Annika. We can hear you now, Rikard, I think. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just want to, uh, I saw in Financial Times now that the two thirds of the Britons are uncertain of the outcome of the negotiations and what will be the result on the 1st of January if there will be a deal or no deal. What is the market thinking about deal or no deal scenario yeah. is your prediction? They have nearly given up. <laughs> <laughs> they have believed in agreement so many times and, and now most people said oh we don't know it will never end up there. Uh, but I, I guess that uh, there are big differences between, between people and I, I think there are no, actually no real answer at the moment because uh, we are so depending on what's coming up from those discussions. So, but, uh, but I think there is a risk that uh, we will postpone it and postpone it and postpone it uh, and um, we are not there yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rikan. I can tell that Rebecca Wolfing of Nasdaq has asked a question as well. So Rebecca, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask Annika your question, feel free to do so. Yes, thank you so much for this great presentation. I was just wondering, how do you think that Brexit is going to affect Swedish companies operating in Sweden, but, you know, obviously with connections to, to the UK? A lot and uh, I think the big companies are rather good prepared. Uh, of course you can't know exactly what will happen but they have spent a lot of time and money uh, to prepare themselves to handle it. But I'm really worried about small companies because they haven't and they can't afford to do it uh, before because they don't know if it's waste money. Uh, so I, I think there will there are big risks that we will see lots of companies uh, uh, ending up with a much bigger problem they, than they have thought about. So I think uh, your organization and a lot of other organizations, you really have to need to help them uh, if we end up in this uh, solution because there are lots of jobs uh, they need to do. And there is of course a risk that the UK uh, as an export market to Sweden will decline even more and um, yeah, that's problematic. We are close uh, friends in many ways, uh, so yeah, that's problematic. So Annika, do you sorry. think that we could, oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, can I can I follow up with a quick yeah. follow up? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Annika. Um, how, from, from the stock market's perspective, what do you think would be the best, best approach for us to support SMEs? Um, maybe a manual, uh, help them to step one, three, four, uh, uh, do this and not this and and so on um, so because it's it's cost a lot of time and they don't have that time uh, to look in all those rules and so on so I think if you can find an easy way to help them ABC uh, then I, I think that's the best way to do it because uh, of course they will listen to people but uh, there will be a lot of information and then it's uh, important to have an, an easy ABC to understand because they don't have the time and, and uh, maybe they maybe they have to um, find solution quickly uh, when we end up there. What an excellent segue for our uh, event on the 4th of November, the mm -hmm. EU exit readiness check for SMEs hosted by Structure Find and Accountant. Um, I can tell that Björn Savén of Eco Invest that you are raising your hand and so if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question please feel free to do so. Okay, first of all, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that I'm not a banker, but an industrialist and an investor. <laughs> Christina. We do. Yeah. Sorry, and, John, I just felt like you know, you're sort of uh, an umbrella over everything there. 
And then, second of all, I'm, I'm deputy chairman of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce here in London, and we've done a lot of work together with the ambassador, Torbjörn Solström. And I have one answer to the prior question, which is, I think the most important thing is to register as an exporter into the UK and get the number you need to continue your exports. Uh, so that's that's a quick answer. Then there's a lot of other stuff, but if you don't that's have that, if you don't have that, the door is closed. Okay. Uh, then I have two uh, a small two small questions to Annika. The, the first I think is easier, but it looks to me with five percent of our exports going to the UK from Sweden, that and about half of less perhaps of our GDP being exports, the the effect. Uh, on and then perhaps a 20% reduction. That sounds to me like it's maybe half a percent loss of GDP for Sweden or something like that in the first year. Mm, somewhere there. Yeah. And the second one is if you give it, could give us a forecast, what do you think the debt to GDP ratio for Sweden will be at the end of this year and next? Uh, firstly, I would say I'm not worried about it uh, because the rates are very low. So I think it's uh, it's good to to use uh, money if you do the right thing. The problem is uh, they are not doing the right thing, yeah. and the problem the problem is that there are a lot lot of parties and they don't have the same goal. So they are doing what they have thought about in decades. And that means that uh, I'm a bit worried about there is no target uh, for them. So I, I think we need to spend money on local government also 23, 24 and 25. So if if I had been Minister of Finance, I have used less money now and have more money left to the coming years because I'm sure we 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 need them though. So maybe you should spend uh, 60, uh, 70 billion crowns instead of 105 this time. And then you have left uh, 40 uh, around uh, for the coming years. But I think it's it's important to help the local government uh, in the future. It's also uh, important to look at education. Uh, some structural changes on the labor market means that people need to educate. And it's also always good to uh, to educate uh, the population. That's the best way to handle um, ah, the bumper road we have to, to handle. And uh, you mentioned, Christina, also uh, a uh, digitalization and so on, which is important. Uh, and then uh, there are company sectors, actually, some need, still needs help uh, depending on the restrictions. So, so the likely GDP, debt to GDP is not going to go up that much, say 42, 43 by the end of the year? Uh, we are surprised that it's so low. We thought actually we'd end up with 50, but we will be low that uh, this year. And as you know, 60% is uh, the target uh, to mm. be a member of, of uh, agreement in EU, uh, Maastricht criteria. And uh, we, we will end up below that, uh, even next year as I see it. Mm -hmm. But it's not just to spend money. You also need to take responsibility over how you spend those money. It's a lot of money of the taxpayer's money. Just give me one year and I'll cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, Ian Richardson joining us from the uh, Stockholm University Executive Education. Uh, I can see that you have asked a question in the chat. So, Ian, yeah. if you would like to unmute yourself, please feel free to do so. Thanks, Emil, and thanks, Annika, for your overview. It was, uh, it was great. Thank you. Um, just a general question. You talked about the appetite for risk uh, at, the, at this time. Um, we've been looking at tech stocks pretty much driving the, the resurgence of the equity markets, a few, a few stocks in particular. I wonder, given the expectations that surround these uh, businesses now, what the impact of a significant sell-off would be. Um, do you have any sort of view on that? Uh, I, I guess the central bankers are so afraid for that, so they will implement more <clears throat> stimulus. And uh, we have heard that both Fed, DCB, and others, uh, they are talking about more. And I, I also think that we now see restrictions, uh, more restrictions. That means that they are on their toes and they will implement. Uh, we will hear from ECB today. Uh, our best forecast is that they will um, 
use December meeting for most emailists, but there are a chance or risk how you look at it that they will mention it at least uh, Christine Lagarde during the meeting today. So I think that you can expect more money from from central bankers if we have a big drop in, in on the equity market and we have seen that before. As soon as it's a bit bumpy, then they are there, or at least telling that they will implement more. And I think it's it will be very tricky for them to step back uh, because uh, when you have had those low rates for such a long time, that means that we have a lot of debt, uh, debt around the world, H- housing sector in some countries, countries in some countries, and so on. And that means that as as soon as uh, the rates start to increase, uh, that means that some have problem, and then they need to step in again. So in the short run, it's good there they are helping us handling this crisis but in the long run it's a bit worrisome. Thank you. Thank you very much Ian. Um, I was wondering, I mean even if the economy is uh, now looking as you're saying Annika we're expecting a strong recovery, there is still quite a lot of uncertainty that you mentioned and uh, focusing on the political risks that we are facing, you you debated on the U.S. election, of course, which is uh, something we do not know the outcome of, of course. Um, but I'm also thinking as we discuss the EU exit. So, what is your um, your expectation? What will be the most damaging or what is the most uh, damaging to the forecasts now, the uncertainty of each different area? Oh, I, I still think it's uh, the global trade. It's it's so important that company, uh, countries open up and, and, and will be opened uh, so we can have the trade. Otherwise, we will have really big uh, problem in lots of countries. So at least for Sweden and the UK, that's uh, so important and for Europe as well. Uh, then I also think there is a risk that when um, leaders are under pressure, uh, they will think about their own country. And I think that's problematic from an EU perspective. We need to work together because we are all too small to, to manage to handle China or the US. Uh, and I can see the risk there that Macron and Merkel are rather far away from each other. They try to sound that they are, are not, but uh, you can you can read between rows that they are. So uh, I think that a bit worrisome. I, I think we really need those agreements. And if Trump uh, win uh, the election, then I think the pressure on Europe will be rather tough because that's the heart of our production mm-hmm. trade. So, uh, staying on the trade issue, um, you mentioned, Annika, that uh, the China economy has recovered, they're doing, they're going forward, they lie far ahead of us, I suppose. Um, We had a discussion during the spring, what are the uh, um, um, risks of very strong China in regards to trade wars and hostile takeovers in Europe and what is your view on on that? Yeah, there are, of course, lots of risk, and I think we have been naive for a while uh, in many countries, and that's why I think it's so important that Europe work together. We can't stand up against China um, nationwide. We need to help each other here, and therefore it's very good if we can do it together with the US, if, if Biden are interesting to have us as an ally uh, against China. Uh, Otherwise, I think we need to take care of both China and the US. Uh, And actually, if you look at US, we have um, our export to US is much bigger than uh, the input from US. So uh, Trump uh, had had right to to put pressure on us, but it's, it's differences between how they will put that pressure on us. And then I also think it's important to look at uh, sustainability questions and so on, which is much more important in Europe, for example. And and there we can also, uh, we also need to work together against both uh, the States and and China. Uh, So um, the pressure from China uh, will be there. Uh, They know what they want to have and uh, we need to to be aware of that. And and, uh, the best thing is uh, even there to work together as I see it. 
I see we have a raised hand, but let me just uh, quickly ask a question regarding um, something which is debating and that we are debating currently, which is the, the new normal of uh, working and uh, business, as you also mentioned, how important the um, how the structure of business is is being handled going forward. Um, uh, one question regarding the property rent levels. Um, we hear that companies do not renew their their rent for for offices for next year. Um, and what is your view on how the new new normal for business from uh, property rent um, levels would look? Yeah, I think we have some structural changes uh, depending on the pandemic. So people that can work at home will do that maybe one or two days in the future as well. That means uh, that we need to handle that. Uh, and uh, we also, if you look at the retail, we are buying much more uh, um, e-markets. Uh, uh, and that means that uh, from that perspective, we also need to take care of that. But it's always very tricky to find out the new jobs, the new areas. We're always talking about what we will leave and lost, but it's also important to think about the new jobs and and there will be new jobs. We will act in a new way, but I think uh, some of those uh, properties which just have retail or just uh, have office, maybe in big cities, they have bigger problem than those who had both uh, uh, living house and, and um, um, a combination of those three areas, uh, for example. So I, but I think they are already changing their mind and looking at uh, structural changes. Uh, so I think maybe we could expect that uh, we are coming into the office and then we will meet people, but we will also have very small room where we can have our themes meeting uh, without uh, disturbing our colleagues. Uh, so I think that will be the way we, we handle them. Uh, mm -hmm workplace in the future. Thank you. Right, I can tell that Christina Bianudstrom, you have raised your hand. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Are you with us, Christine? Maybe not. So in the meantime, um, Annika, what, what is your view on London staying the financial market of Europe after the EU exit, the transition period? What is your mm. view? Uh, if you ask people in the financial market, they love London. <laughs> and uh, I think most people uh, still actually believe that London will be very, very important. And I think also uh, the economy, UK, they will come back, uh, even if they are under tough pressure at the moment. They have been coming back earlier and we will see that again. But of course, it's a, it's a wet blanket on them at the moment. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's stupid and too early to, to count them out. They will be there and they will be important in the future as well. Mm -hmm. So Christine, are you ready to ask your question? Yes, I am. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annika, for the uh, excellent insight uh, presentation. Um, my question is on your thoughts uh, in the uh, economics today. What are your thoughts uh, on uh, an aging and slow growing population and uh, what how could that contribute uh, to an economy mm. uh, that's a long term problem uh, in a lots of countries uh, and therefore my answer to bjorn was that i think it's uh, uh, good to save money for the coming years as well because we are running up in, in that uh, perspective in the money countries and, and in Sweden as well. So I think that uh, we need to work longer uh, in some countries at least uh, and we need to be uh, more years on the uh, employed. Uh, um, but I also think that uh, we have to take care of the pension system for example which is worrisome for a lot of people. So there are lots of questions uh, coming up here, but uh, we have seen other countries entering those problems earlier than we have done. Uh, and there are actually no 
easy answer to those questions. Uh, the best way to handle it is that you help people come out on the labor market as soon as possible and help them to stay there as long as possible uh, to handle uh, this uh, situation. Thank you very much, Christine, uh, for your question. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time. There are so much to discuss and so much to learn from you, Annika. Thank you for a very interesting presentation and very insightful. I'm going to bring with me that we are seeing a strong recovery. So I think your presentation was much more positive than we have heard so far, which I'm very pleased about. We need that as well. Are there any last comments that you would like to, to make before we round off? No, I will just say thank you and, and remember to, to be humble, but uh, also remember the recovery. We are back in many ways and it's important to have that in your in your mind. And I think Q3 will be a strong quarter in, in nearly the whole world. And that's important when you're taking decisions. In thank you very much for listening in and for, for your questions. And thank you very much again, Annika, for, for your presentation and for sharing all of this with us. And thank you all for um, joining us this morning and for your questions. Do join us uh, soon again. You see our calendar on the screen, 3rd of November and 4th of November. And there will be much more um, of our events coming up after that. But uh, thank you very much, everyone, for today. And I look forward to seeing you all soon again. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.